And welcome back to another episode of the Media Boat Podcast, your weekly episodes on us talking about movies, TV, music, and video games. Not necessarily in that order. My name is Mike. His name is Matt. My name is Matt. His name is Mike. Thank you for joining us on this fine September the 26th, 2023. Today is episode 402. And we've got good news today uh, coming out of um, the writers, and we have all sorts of other news to talk about. Uh, so let's get rolling right into it. Yeah, let's get right into it, shall we? And we always start this with the music section, and we have the music section with the Billboard Hot 100, your singles chart. And your number one single in the land is Slime You Out by Drake featuring SZA. Did I say that right? <laughs> yeah, I believe you did. I don't know. I haven't heard this. Uh, I don't know what it sounds like. But hey, Drake is back, I guess. Yeah, I mean, yes, Drake <laughs> is back, but also slime you out. Yeah, it sounds weird. I don't like how that sounds. I don't know. At two, Paint the Town Red by Doja Cat. At three, Snooze. <laughs> by yeah. SZA uh, at 4 Fast Car by Luke Combs and we already got your top 5 I Remember Everything <laughs> by Zach Bryan featuring Casey Musgraves and yes that is right SZA has 2 singles in the top 5 of the Hot 100 Indeed, well, one is a featuring credit but you know still counts as for your albums chart your Billboard 200 at number 1 Nostalgia by Rod Wave. At yeah. two, Guts by Olivia Rodrigo, dropping down. At three, Zach Bryan by Zach Bryan. At <laughs> four, One Thing at a Time by Morgan Wallen. And rounding out your top five, SLS by SZA. Yeah. SZA back in the charts um, this week. Yeah. If you didn't like any of those albums, we have new releases. Starting with Isn't It Now by Animal Collective. <laughs> uh, we Buy Diabetic <laughs> Test Strips by Armand Hammer. <laughs> <laughs> He's baffled, folks. I baffled by this next one. Sit Down for Dinner by Blonde Redhead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I Don't Want You Anymore by Cherry Glazer. The Above by Code Orange. Autumn Variations by Ed Sheeran. Yes, that Ed Sheeran without a math symbol in the name. Yep. Did he run out of math symbols? I think when he does like a side thing, it's not an official record. He doesn't bother with the weird. Oh, that's why it's a variation. Symbols. Yeah, I okay. think it's something else. All right. I'm waiting for uh, Exponent. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that's the next one. Squared. Squared. <laughs> <laughs> um, subscript or um, what was it? Uh, what's the. Uh, uh, Oh God, he, he he just needs to do decimal yes. point or percentage. Oh, he did percentage. I don't think he's done percentage yet. He did divide. Yeah. He did divide. Yes. All right. Uh, we also have "Falling or Flying" by Georgia Smith. "Daydreamer" by Molly Birch. Again, by <laughs> One Hotrix. Point never. <laughs> Uh, Yard by Slow Pulp. And lastly, Cousin by Wilco. Yes, that Wilco. That Wilco. Yeah, that's, that's what we got. Log, that's what I'm thinking of. The log symbol. That'd oh. be great. The log by Ed Sheeran. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a picture of a log underneath. That'd be yes. great. Log to the 10th. All right. Uh, anyways, anyway. let's. And anyway, let's get some music news, shall we? And we'll yes. start with Live Nation. So they 
have launched a new program called On the Road Again. Don't want to get screwed while we call it On the Road Again. <laughs> exactly. But we'll have to fight it with my best friend <laughs> if we're going to use On the Road Again. So, yes, they're going to call a new program called On the Road Again to right. financially support developing artists and their teams facing growing costs of touring expenses. In making the announcement, the concert promoter has indeed partnered with Willie Nelson, who lent his 1980 country single to the anthem for the initiative. <laughs> Live Nation owned and operated clubs are expected to deliver tens of millions of dollars in extra earnings to club artists and crew by providing $1,500 in gas and travel cash per show to all headliners and supporting acts on top of their nightly performance compensation. Additionally, these clubs will charge no merchandise selling fees, so artists keep 100% of merch profits. Mm -hmm. Um, little note there that this follows a summer of Twitter X debate among artists and fans about merch cuts from venues, which is started by a tweet from indie punk mainstay Jeff Rosenstock. So I included that for some context because this has been a conversation over music Twitter over the last uh, few months, um, kind of sparked by Jeff's conversation. It's obviously not the first time that this has been a debate. Um, touring bands often will complain about venues taking a cut of merch, which really eats into a band's ability to make money on tour, which is crucial because one of the things about the streaming music industry is some of the, one of the only ways to make money as a band now is to sell merch on tour. But if you're having a giant percentage cut out of that from the venues you're playing at, that's a lot of missed opportunity. And so bands are rightfully angry about this. So Live Nation doing this is interesting because uh, it's kind of caused a dual reaction uh, from, from artists today. There are some who are rightfully pointing out that a decision this big from a company this big does get a lot of eyeballs on it. And it is a step towards tours being more uh, financially reasonable. Like a lot of bands struggle on tour. It's an expensive thing to do. And this is at least potentially offering some financial, like uh, like an option for less of a financial strain on bands. But I've also seen a reaction point out the flaws of the system. So it's not all Live Nation owned venues. They have a list Mm -hmm. You can access that shows you which ones this applies to and which ones it doesn't. Um, also, it's uh, unfortunately like yet another tool that Live Nation can use to potentially cannibalize other smaller venues they don't own that don't have the money to afford this kind of thing. So right. it makes a band's, if a band's choice then is, well, financially, what can we afford to do? They might be put in a position where instead of going to the smaller independent venue that they used to go to all the time, this now incentivizes them to choose the Live Nation owned venue instead, which then eliminates the opportunities that the smaller venue had with these bands. That's where that's why I just did a quick search up in is yeah. that okay, so this is Live Nation, which is part of Ticketmaster Live Nation. Yes. And if this is going strictly to the clubs and not the um arenas or music venues that is strictly for the clubs why target just the clubs and not the music venue i think you just hit the nail on the head it's yeah. to incentivize that hey if you come to these smaller venues we'll still get our get drive everyone to Ticketmaster, live nation and get them there yeah. so we can get them to other venues like that but backdoor into having the monopoly of yeah. well your artist is going to play here so you're going to use our service yeah so like anything a giant corporation does, what looks good on face value may have some secrets. And in this case, it's the case here. Uh, so yeah, just keep that in mind. But like I said at first, this is a baby step. 
and any step is better than no steps. And it does get visibility on the concept of venues not taking merch cuts from their artists. So, hey, maybe this leads to good things down the road. Uh, but for now, it is a potentially problematic thing for the smaller independent venues that are trying to protect themselves against Live Nation. Right. And what I can see is this, is what would normally be a one night event now extends into a two night event and your 1500 mm -hmm. becomes 3000 just right. like that because right. you decided to stay the extra night and play the extra day so yeah um we'll see you ended up how this ends up like if tour if uh artists on tour actually take advantage of this and see what the actual effect of it is if they do end up making more money this way or not it'll be interesting to see what happens all right uh so let's get into our second news story and that's yes. Jill with football but wait we're gonna go on a little journey here <laughs> yes this is a three-part story i'm going to segue from one thing that's seemingly unrelated to the third thing by connecting it with a second thing that acts as a bridge yes we're gonna go from google to usher and you'll see just why <laughs> yes so first off google all right mm -hmm. yeah. in case you are not a part of the uh swifter sphere <laughs> Uh, the Swifties have been madly solving a variety of ranges of puzzles via Google as part of a, a reveal for her upcoming vault tracks on the upcoming 1989 Taylor's version album. Well, they've solved them all, and Taylor mm -hmm. Swift has now shared the complete track list, including the fifth vault track that was not previously shared by Google. And yes... It's not uh, Lutz like most people think. <laughs> no, she went there. It's Slut with the point. exclamation point. Mm -hmm. uh, the others include, is it now? Is it over now? Don't say go. No, say don't go. Don't say go. Wait, no, say don't go. <laughs> yeah. Go don't Sorry. say. <laughs> don't go say. Go say don't. No. Mm -hmm. No. Um, <laughs> now that we don't talk and suburban legends, <laughs> uh, in total, there were 89 puzzles and the track names were revealed after only 33 million <laughs> people had completed the task. First question. Did you do any of these puzzles? By the time I realized what this was, they were already at 22 million. <laughs> <laughs> I got on when there were only two million solved. I did seven of them and then went to bed. And then when I woke up, I was like, oh, shit, they solved that in like three hours. Yes. I, when I saw that was at 22 million, uh, someone had posted like here, in case you don't want to do like yeah. all the work, here's the cheat code for it. I also saw an article that was just like, here are all the answers. I didn't. Yes. I read a couple of them. And I was like, actually, these seem real easy. And sure enough, all seven I did was like, oh, yeah, I just I just know this stuff. But I'm also yeah. a fan. I wonder how somebody would have done if they hadn't had any Taylor knowledge. Right. Like, I wonder if they'd just be like looking at these puzzles and be like, what the hell? What is this? Like, how, how deep of a cut did you go? Right. Or exactly. Did you think it went? <laughs> I mean, I thought some of them were pretty, pretty obscure uh, comparatively, but some of them were pretty obvious. Um, the second question I have for you. What do you think slut is? <laughs> I think we're saying it wrong. I think it's slut. Oh, slut. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Extend the ooh part. The <laughs> you put a little umlaut over it. It's slut. Because I I have a theory on what I think this uh, this song is. Mm -hmm. uh, my prediction is that it is a companion song to Blank Space, in which just like Blank Space, it was written to be a commentary on how she was perceived in the press at the time. And so I'm guessing it's from the perspective of somebody talking about her, about sleeping around or dating a lot of people or something. That is my assumption about what this is. That seems like the Taylor move. It's also why the title is in quotes on the track list. That's important to note. There's an exclamation point and the word is in quotes. It is being said. So it is not, I don't think she's the one saying it is what I'm saying. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't read too far into that. Like, we only have, what, two weeks until this actually comes out on the 13th? Yeah. 
Yeah, soon. Wait, thirteenth, right? No. Wait, hold on. The thirteenth is the film. Yes. When, when is the album? I want to say it's the thirteenth as well. I don't think it's the same day. Why wouldn't it be the same day? She likes thirteen. Maybe it is the same day. It would make really? sense. That it's the same day. That way, she okay. conquers two of our uh, news stories. I thought it was the ninth, but maybe I was thinking of the ninth is a Monday. Oh yeah, then it wouldn't be the ninth. Oh, anyway. was, well, the ninth was uh, August, uh, July seventh. Well, that was oh, the maybe that's what I'm thinking of. Uh, just a second, 1989 Taylor's version. Right, it's supposed um, to come out on the release date, the 27th. Oh, 27th. So it's actually uh, um, after two weeks the movie later. Is released. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Never mind. All right. Well, 27th. You know, it's not like 87, <laughs> which is our next story. Yes. As Taylor Swift was seen at the. <laughs> Uh, this past Sunday at Arrowhead Stadium wearing a number 87 jersey. <laughs> well, I don't know if she was wear- actually wearing the jersey, but I know the mom was right next to him. Yes. Next to her. As she was there at the Chiefs Bear Games amid all the rumors that she was currently and secretly probably, maybe, <laughs> could be unconfirmed uh, rumors of dating Chiefs tight end Travis Kelsey. Okay, so I don't really have that many thoughts about this uh, because I don't really know much about the guy. However, I'm going to pass this to you because you not only are a football fan and you know who Travis Kelsey is and what he does, but also you have the benefit of having watched at least one season, possibly two, of his reality show called, (laughs) what was it called? Catching Kelsey. And this is now season three of Catching Kelsey, yes. Yeah, we're living it is is actually season three is just really happening in front of us is basically well, what you're saying. See, let's go even deeper because in my fantasy football draft, I had drafted both Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey for that stack. Yes. Uh-huh. And I had drafted running backs, Jonathan Taylor and DeAndre Swift. So right. my teammate could be the <laughs> homie Taylor Swift. <laughs> and I still have Travis Kelsey sitting right there. Yeah, it's perfect. You really set that up without even knowing that this was going to happen. Oh, this is like deep rumors here. <laughs> okay, so tell me what you think about this pairing. Do you think that Travis Kelsey, with the knowledge that you have about this man, he seems like a nice guy, but he also seems like a goofball. Uh, yes, but also, been... if you want to know more about Travis Kelsey, <laughs> there's the documentary called Kelsey uh, uh-huh. out on Amazon Prime for you to watch as well. Uh, even though it does focus primarily on his brother, uh, Jason, who is the, the center for the mm-hmm. Eagles, and we know that she is an Eagles yes. fan because it was the Eagles shirt on yeah. the bedpost. Right. Uh huh. Um, this is actually like could be tangentially related. Like, would she root for the Eagles or the Chiefs? Who knows? Uh, but also, isn't Arrowhead where she announced that um, <laughs> so, uh, Taylor's version or the was it, was it 1989? No, no, that was L.A. The one before this. Yeah, so speak now. Speak now. No, sorry. Was that Arrowhead or was that Nashville? I don't know. One of them. <laughs> They're close enough, I think. Regardless, the point is, is that this all but confirms that they are dating. Well, yes. Also does the what they did afterwards, which was yes. drive around, shotgun in his car with, <laughs> with the top down and her hair undone. <laughs> uh, and then... Um, Renting out a restaurant for both the uh, Taylor and her friends and then the entire Kansas City Chiefs yeah. so, uh, offense as well. Side question. What do you think Eagles fans think about this? Uh, I mean, they're 3-0, and so do they really care about a 2-1 team? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> also, they probably think that they got the better Kelsey because he's at least like a family man. Who has three right. kids now? Okay. And not All like right. try to chase the clout. But I think as a whole, um, the NFL is probably psyched about this because now they have more people wanting to tune in to Oh, they're the already NFL taking games. yeah, they're already taking advantage of it. Somebody on uh Twitter pointed out that the NFL's uh image that they posted on social media for that game mm-hmm. was a shot of the box and Taylor's reaction. Because of course. Yes. 
every gonna, opening uh yeah, for like all the like uh sports highlights from from uh, Sunday night on was mm-hmm. first image Travis Kelsey catching the touchdown cut to Taylor Swift celebrating yeah. in the box before she said let's fucking go but you know yeah I was gonna say <laughs> That's great I love that um here's so here's my my going to be uh, my attempt at a segue um however one thing Taylor won't be doing this uh next year though is uh doing the Super Bowl halftime show because she's probably going to be pretty tired of doing arena shows but wait a minute she's gonna be in europe this time right yeah but we do know though who will be doing that halftime show yes well you can't get the actual like headliner which is taylor swift to perform there maybe you can get an usher to escort you down there (laughs) or you could get the usher yeah 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 Mm -hmm. yeah yeah Yeah. times three yes yeah Mm -hmm. oh my god omg (laughs) Uh, (laughs) yes that usher has officially been announced that he'll be headlining the uh 2024 super bowl halftime show presented by apple music Uh the nfl and rock nation which was announced on sunday uh the game which will take place at allegiant stadium in las vegas nevada uh will be on sunday february 11th 2024 airing Uh on cbs Usher uh, would follow in the footsteps of Rihanna, who performed just this past year uh, uh, while pregnant. Yes, we have to put that. <laughs> she was also pregnant. Um, and the 2022 LA studded show, which featured Dr. Dre, Kendrick Lamar, Mary J. Blige, Snoop Dogg, Eminem, and an upside down 50 Cent. Mm-hmm. Uh, quote from Usher It's an honor. And a life, it's, a, it's an honor of a lifetime to finally check a Super Bowl performance off my bucket list. I can't wait to bring the world a show unlike anything else they've seen from me before. Thank you to the fans and everyone who made this opportunity happen. I'll see you real soon. Happy Super Bowl. Xbox. Okay, why... Yeah. why <laughs> He didn't, he didn't really he didn't really say that last part. Okay, but why is it in the quote here? <laughs> you have you seen those videos? Oh yeah, you didn't have an Xbox 360. So there was a time where Usher was doing a bunch of videos for Xbox in which he would record like saying something nice around a holiday. So if you Google for example, Usher Easter Xbox, you'll find a video in which he says, Happy Easter Xbox. <laughs> and there's several of these. It's great. It's wonderful. So I snuck that in there. Um, <laughs> anyway, it's, there'll be people out there that are listening to this that will understand the joke. Uh, anyway, um, it's important to note, Usher was uh, was not their first choice. Um, I saw an article <laughs> in which um, apparently Miley Cyrus was reached out to first, uh, but she declined just because she said she didn't want to do it. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I do wonder whether there were several artists that were approached before Usher or maybe Usher was in that top five they were looking for. I don't know. Uh, regardless, it's interesting that they're referring to Usher as a headliner here. That makes me think that later we will learn some other artists that might be involved in the, this show, and it may not just be Usher. Well, Usher has collaborated with several artists on other songs as well, yeah, including J Lo, including Pitbull. So, wouldn't be surprised to see and Lil John Lil them. and Lil John. Yeah, yeah, I want to see Lil John there. So, what song do you think he opens this up with? Uh, I mean, it's yeah, because that's his biggest hit. Yeah, times three. Is it really? You want to start with some "Love in the Club"? There's that. Um, uh, I mean, if we're just going OMG. through Usher songs, if we're just going through Usher songs, you could do "Let It Burn." You could right. do the U-turn. Um, what else? What else does Usher um, have? Confessions. Uh, you can talk about his confessions. Can. <laughs> yeah, he can list yeah. his confessions to us. Uh, yeah, I mean, Usher has hits. It's not a bad choice. I mean, it's surprisingly late in his career for this, but hey, all power to him. Um, I mean, when's the last time he had a hit? Twenty. 
16 it yeah it, it's he's he hasn't been as prolific lately as he used to be this is this is true uh but yeah i i think that he can do a show but the way that the league and the way he's talking about it i would bet that there are other people involved in the show and we will learn who that is later so how many lasers do you think are pointing out of him <laughs> out of him <laughs> yes. i don't know is that just gonna be the show? Just gonna be a laser outline of him as he moves and dances to it? Yeah, yeah, like an iPod ad. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I would love to see that. Anyway, so yeah, Usher halftime show. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, hey, we did from Google to Usher. We did it. We made it. Right. Um, did you listen to anything? So I listened to like seventy-five percent of Doja Cat Scarlet. Uh. It's fine. It's she's in rap mode. So if you want to hear Doja Cat rapping a lot, um, there's a lot there. Uh, if you think everything's going to sound like the single right now, um, uh, Paint the Town Red, you're going to be disappointed. Mm. It's probably the lightest song on the record. Otherwise, it's a pretty heavy rap record and she's kind of all over the place with it. I didn't love it. I didn't love it enough to even finish listening to it. Uh, but if that sounds appealing to you, if you want to like have hard rap Doja Cat, then go for it i guess i just wish it was more fun because that's the thing about doja cat she can be fun and, and she can be have a sense of humor i think mm -hmm. this is her trying to prove something and it's definitely more of that kind of vibe but all yeah right. that, that's all that's all i listened to uh this week next week on my radar is that cherry glazer record um and that slow pulp record uh but yeah not much going, else going on yeah, uh, not much here. I tried to listen to the Brothers Osborne record. No, mm. scratch that. I tried to listen to the revamped record uh, from uh, Demi, Lovato. Demi Lovato. I forgot. I listened to that last week as well. I didn't talk about it. I got two songs into it, and then I yeah. it, it was just I don't know if it's just me, but I couldn't really make a huge difference between them. Yeah, that's the biggest problem I have with it. The whole concept of it is Demi is taking all of her songs and just being like hey let's re-record them as rock songs that only works for some of the songs number one some of them it does not work at all and mm -hmm. two it only works if the production is good and the production is uh, kind of bad throughout and it doesn't sound great it so... does seem like it's like they're saying it's a rock version because there's a guitar bridge and just, <laughs> yeah. uh, that's where it slides right into it like see rock version right it's it's disappointing i mean I guess if you want rock versions of these songs, try them out individually. Like, just seek out your favorites. Some mm -hmm. of them work better than others. Like, the pop songs fare the worst here. Uh, cool for the Summer is already great. They ruin it with the rock recording, and it's just mm -hmm. not good anymore. So, also, I recommend, if you're curious at all about those things, I recommend, instead of listening to the record, checking out the YouTube clip of her VMAs performance, where she does several of these songs live. The live performance is better than some of the recordings all right uh, uh yeah i don't listen to anything else new otherwise all righty all right guess. so then let's get keep on going here and let's go right into some video games and we start with Indeed. new releases yes. including train sim world for everything <laughs> but the switch it's okay you get paleo pines for everything if you got it you can play it uh mint Minecos, Mineco, mm -hmm. Minecos, um, Night Market for the PC and the Switch. That will be coming to other consoles uh, in a couple weeks. All right. We also have Harvest Moon, colon, The Winds of Anthos for everything. You got it? You can play it. We also have the first, uh, is this DLC or expansion? expansion? This is a proper expansion to Cyberpunk. All right, Cyberpunk 2077, colon, Phantom Liberty for the PC, PS5, and Xbox Series X. I have heard good things about this expansion. I've mm -hmm. also, this also coincides with the 2.0 release of the game, which revamps and corrects a lot of the bugs and issues from the original. So if you see this game being re-reviewed lately and reappraised, that's why uh, people are saying that it's a much, much more improved uh, product than its original launch. So uh, if you've been waiting to check out Cyberpunk, this is apparently the time to do it. All right. uh, we also have My Hero Ultra Rumble for the PC, PS4, 
Xbox One, and Switch. You gonna check this out? This is a battle royale based on My Hero Academia. I've seen this. Um, I think only if it's like a free to play. <laughs> it better be. It better be. <laughs> well, I don't know because that crash thing, the crash rumble, was not a free to play. That's true, but Activision, you yeah, know, who knows? <laughs> yeah. Uh, we also have Infinity Strash colon Dragon Quest, the Adventure of Die for everything. Uh, you got it? you can play it. This is a disaster of a name. Like if it wasn't for the Dragon Quest in there inserted yes. in the middle, I don't know what the hell Infinity Strash is. What's a strash? You call it Infinity Strash colon the Adventure <laughs> of Die. You would <laughs> really not even include that. I just don't understand Quest. what strash is. Is it like trash? Like what is strash? Is it typed wrong? I don't know. I copied and pasted it. Strash. <laughs> no, it is trash. <laughs> what the hell is trash? Please, if you know what a strash is, uh, please email us mediapodcast at gmail dot com. We need to know. Right. Uh, it, it's it an, an based on the anime events. So what? I don't know. I know what a strash is. I don't know what a strash is. Anyways, let's move on. All right. Uh, we also have a uh, Disney Speedstorm for everything. You got it. You can play it. This, I believe, this is the free version. Uh, if you were part of the Founders Pack and you wanted to buy it, you could have already done that. I think, I believe, this is the free version now, right? Yeah, yeah. Racing game with Disney characters. Yes, uh, stylized racing game with Disney characters. Uh, also, I believe I'll check this out. I believe it's also coming to mobile at the same time. Mm -hmm. So when it downloads to my phone, I will play it and I will tell you what the difference is between that and the PS5 version. Got it. Uh, we also have, we might also do conversation with the Switch since that's there. I can fire that one up for a while. Maybe. Uh, we also have Fate slash Samurai Remnant for <laughs> PC, PS4, PS5, and the Switch. Yeah. We also Samurai. have EA Sports FC24. Mm -hmm. This is no longer the FIFA game. This right. is their Football Club 24 version. Yes. Uh, for everything. You got it. You can play it. EA's big push, big release. Uh, there's also Cocoon for everything. And then Trepong 2 for the PS5 and Xbox Series S. Yep. Lots to play. Basically, if you need to get out by the end of Q3, <laughs> it's going to come out. Yeah, this is kind of the cutoff for that. Yep. I mean, considering that, yeah, this is the 29th. So, yeah, it's literally this and then yep. we get knocked Shove them out the door. Yep. All right. Let's get some video game news then. And we start with a bit of an update. Well, mm -hmm. it's an update, but it's also a walk back as <laughs> Unity has decided to at least partially walk back some of its controversial monetization plans for its popular game engine. All right. Just. So you can all get on the same page here. <laughs> Last week, the software development company announced plans to charge developers every time a game that uses its Unity engine is installed. Following a huge backlash from game developers, Unity later issued an apology and said it planned to make changes to the policy, which it would communicate in the coming days. Well, on Friday, the company uh, detailed those exact changes. Firstly, Unity confirmed it will no longer be charging per install fees for those using Unity Personal or Plus plans. The new Unity runtime fee will only apply to Unity Pro and Unity Enterprise. More importantly, the fees will no longer apply to existing games. Quote um, from Unity's Mark Witten, only those created with or upgraded to the long-term support versions released in 2024 or later, um, currently referred to as the 2023 long-term support, will be impacted. For those games, the fee is now only applicable after a game crossed the crosses two thresholds. One million dollars in gross revenue and trailing uh, for for the following 12 months 
and 1 million initial engagements. So, uh, yeah. Roughly downloads. So it's kind of a mixed victory. I think what uh, most developers are saying is it's good that they walked back the most egregious parts of this and mm -hmm. made it so that the vast majority of smaller studios will not encounter this. It does still suck that there's a version of it, though, still hovering around that you could find yourself involved in if your care if your game make like makes these thresholds. But above all, regardless of how you feel about the walk back, the biggest reaction I've seen is it's too little too late. It seems like the vast majority of developers who were angry at Unity for making this choice in the first place are still angry because it's trust that completely fell through. It's now they look at a Unity as a company. Well, we don't know if you are going to mistreat us in the future. We don't know if you are going to change your mind about this too and then switch it on on us out of nowhere. They've proven that they can't be trusted now. And so all of that, all of those relationships have essentially eroded. So they were probably hoping that announcing this walk back was going to bring up everybody back to the fold. It didn't. It basically now, like they already burned the bridge, essentially, is how most developers feel. And so this was, regardless of what they walk back and how much they want to change, the, the deed is already done. Like, and Unity that's what we talked no about longer, last week. Right. The Unity is no longer the company that they were from here on out. And there's no amount of apologizing or walking back that they can do to regain the trust. It's done. Yeah, I mean, if you want to hear our comments about it, we have the previous episode, but mm -hmm. also that they're changing it going forward for 2024. I mean, yes, it's good that anything that was created prior to this is not going to get touched. But like you said, going forward in 2024 and beyond, they're going to write it in there saying we can update our terms of service whether we like it to or not <laughs> going forward for long term support. Yeah, this still, I think the long-term uh, effect of this is you still probably see a mass exodus away from Unity going forward. I don't think this changes um, anybody's perspective on Unity after last week. Mm -hmm. But they can try. They're just not going to, they're just not going to be able to do it. They lost the hearts and minds game. Yep. Uh, I mean, the only way they can get it back is someone creates a super awesome game or they really revamp their tools and make it more available for those uh, personal or plus plans. But I don't know. We'll see. We will see. Uh, but that's not the only update that we have because we also no. have an update from SAG AFTRA. So, yes. members of SAG AFTRA, the uh, Actors Labor Union, uh, have voted overwhelmingly in favor of a potential video game strike action. Keyword here is the yes. potential strike action. Union members voted 98% in favor of strike authorization regarding the interactive media agreement, which covers members' work on video games. While this doesn't necessarily mean a strike is going to be called yet, it does mean that if SAG-AFTRA doesn't get the terms it considers acceptable while negotiating the interactive media agreement, it can call a strike right away. No one gets members already support that decision. We saw the yes. same thing happen with the studios where they voted overwhelmingly in favor of striking, and here we are with SAG-AFTRA on strike against the um, AMPTP, the producers. Yes, yes. so... Uh, we will have to wait and see. Uh, this is basically, yeah, they'll. this is the button they push if there's no deal reached. Um, and yeah, if this happens, this will be the second time in recent history in the last decade in which the, the, the uh, sag after has stri struck against the video game companies. Uh, two, I uh, did no want to note today uh, that this doesn't affect just voice actors. This would also affect motion capture actors who do that kind of work for video games as well. That, in a lot of cases, is even harder hours than just voice acting is. It's a lot of the same people doing both of those things, especially in big budget games like Naughty Dog's games like the Uncharted series or The Last mm -hmm. of Us are heavy in use of uh, motion capture 
So yeah, this would really affect a lot of different kinds of games if this strike does go into place. Yeah, I mean, we would see even bigger delays. We saw delays with COVID with everyone working from home. Yet, mm-hmm. And we just, when we feel like we're getting back on track, <laughs> here we are with this, potentially getting also another G government. I do wonder, though, who are the 10 people that voted in favor of this? <laughs> of not striking? Against, against, against the strike, the strike? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I don't know. They're I don't, going to be pariahs at the meetings now. Was, was, uh, was it 1.7%? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, small. L- literal 1% against it. Yeah. Um, but honestly, as we always are here at the Media Vote Podcast, hey, we're, we're obviously in support of the of the, the union members for getting a better contract. Uh, voice acting is hard. Uh, motion capture is hard. Video games are, notor- are notoriously anti-union establishments. They have been since their inception. Unions and video games are a recent thing um, in the actual studios. So this is a, an actual storied union with a lot of history that will be going against these companies who are traditionally anti-union. Uh, it didn't go well last time. So it'll be interesting to see what happens this time if a strike does occur. Uh, but yeah, of course, uh, we're in their corner. Uh, I hope that they are able to get a fair contract uh, for the work that they do because it's vital. And also uh, work that I hope to maybe do someday. Hey. So... <laughs> So you're we'll looking. That so you're looking at this closely, then. Looking at this closely, we'll see. Uh, but yeah, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to see. I I hope that they uh, get what they uh, they deserve and need. Exactly. All right. So you completed a game. You did a write up yes. on this game yes. on MediaBuiltPodcast dot com. Yes. But why don't you tell me about Goodbye Volcano High? Yes, I finished. Uh, Goodbye Volcano High, which is a narrative adventure game. Think Life of Life is Strange, um, made by an indie studio called Co-op. This is on PC and PS5. This was actually uh, related to the PS5 as it was part of the original tra- uh, group of trailers that were shown in the PS5 reveal uh, uh, web stream um, that they did. So a lot of eyeballs have been on this game. It had a bit of a tumultuous uh, development history. One of the lead writers on the original project um, uh, got pushed out of the studio and kind of uh, left from from what I understand on non-amicable terms. Um, And then it kind of had to be rewritten and reformulated after that. But since then, um, I'm happy to report that the final product that came out earlier this summer um, is fantastic. It's easily probably the my favorite game i've played of the year mm-hmm. uh like you mentioned i have a write-up of uh, my thoughts uh in more depth on mediabookpodcast.com if you want to read what those are but my smaller version uh, that i'll say here is it takes the template of a game like life is strange and in my opinion improves it on that template in almost every way it's a really likable uh group of characters It's a wonderful, like a a really interesting and compelling setting. It takes high school uh, tropes and cliches, but is clever and uh, creative enough using them that doesn't feel derivative. It doesn't feel like, oh, we've been there before. Even moments in the Life is Strange games feel a little like, all right, we've done this teen drama stuff before. Goodbye Volcano High has enough spin on it and enough creativity where it never felt like it was stuck and mired by those tropes, in my in, in my opinion. It really felt like it was having fun with the concept. Well, as much fun as you can have when the story literally ends in the, like, essentially apocalypse. Um, and that's, I think, the, cool, the, the most interesting part of the game is the themes that it deals with. It's pretty heavy uh, um, at face value. You are dealing with thoughts of what does it mean when the world ends, especially if you're like a high school senior, like about to graduate, like what about my future? What about all the things I wanted to do? What about college? Like it really is, it, it really interrogates these characters about how it feels to have that future potentially just obliterated in the blink of an eye, what it means to not have these opportunities. And each of these characters react to that in different but still realistic ways. And it's really smartly done. And it never sounds super like, oh, this is how teen- how we think teenagers talk. It sounds very realistic. 
the dialogue's really well written. And like I said, the characters are likable enough that you feel invested in these stories. You want them to succeed. You want to find out what happens to them. Um, it feels modern, but without sacrificing that relatability that like, oh yeah, I had friends like this in high school, or this reminds me of an experience in high school. At the same time, it's feeling very of the moment, um, how um, a real teenager now in 2023 would think, would talk, would react, including like peeks into what their social media looks like, peeks into their interaction with, you know, like with, um, you know, LGBT queer themes. Like uh, it does a really good job of talking to the non-binary experience, the trans experience, the gay experience. It manages to do all of these things and it does it really convincingly and really sweetly. Uh, but it's a video game. So I'll take a moment to talk about the video game part of it. I think it's a really good one of those kind of choose your adventure uh, narrative uh, visual novel kind of uh, things. Your choices do matter, but not as maybe as much as they could. It's not like a really intricate web of things. Like you can't like really customize. This is not Baldur's Gate 3 is what I'm saying. <laughs> but you do see minor changes depending on what you choose to do, including an ending that is set up in a Mass Effect 2 style of way where you get to interact with certain characters only if you've basically done missions, even though they're not framed like that in this game, um, with that character. If you've befriended a certain character and gone kind of in a pathway where you've really befriended them, you're going to get a slightly different ending with them than maybe you would have otherwise. Maybe you'll learn more about that character than you would have if you had ignored them or said something else to them earlier in the game. It's subtle, and I like how the game doesn't shove that in your face. It eases you into these things in a realistic way. So you'll end up that way just by having regular conversations and reacting like you would if you were the character. And then the most interesting thing they've done with the interactive part of the game are the rhythm games. So just like Life is Strange, you can't just have a visual novel like this without some sort of gameplay quirk, some sort of gimmick, for lack of a better term. And I think the rhythm game gimmick here is better than the time travel stuff from Life is Strange. In fact, I feel like even Life is Strange as a franchise realized that that didn't work. It's not even there in the in Before the Storm, the prequel. They just throw it out. They're just like, eh, this is just a narrative choice game. We don't, we're not going to actually have gameplay. But I'm happy to report that I actually really enjoyed the rhythm games here. Um, you get to play alongside the band as they kind of do their gigs and do their practice. Um, there's a, uh, it, a little rock band DNA to it because you're kind of holding a direction in anticipation of a note to come down as opposed to pressing it, though there are button press timing as well. Um, and that stuff works better than I thought it was going to. Now, if you're playing on PS5 and you have a history of issues with rhythm games with calibration, bad news, there's no calibration in the menu. So you hmm. will have to um, kind of just cross your fingers and hope that there's not an audio visual delay on your rig. I was playing on PC, didn't have that problem. PC headphones, I didn't have a delay, but console players might run into that. Um, but there is an option. There's no calibration in the options, but there is an option for making those windows more broad. So that way, if you are having difficulty, you can turn that on and see if that makes your experience easier. It's also something to be considered if you were playing this game and you don't have an experience, a lot of experience with rhythm games or you don't have a great rhythm in general. <laughs> turn that on and then it becomes something you can easily do. But one thing I wanted to point out about that, that uh, isn't mine. I'm borrowing it from the review that went up on Eurogamer about this, which they gave five stars, by the way, it was a really good review. Um, they mentioned that the coolest thing about the approach to the rhythm games in Goodbye Volcano High is that unlike Rock Band Guitar Hero, where you're playing for the high score, there's no such thing in Goodbye Volcano High. You're doing well at it because you want the band to do well. And so it is a game mechanic that actually does feel like it has bearing on the story, even though it probably doesn't. There probably isn't really a change in whatever happens after that, depending like whether or not you're good at them or not, quote unquote. But if you are good at it, you feel proud because you're like, oh, we did it. Like we, the band, did it. And it helps really hammer home the 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 strength of those scenes. And it's really well timed with some of the biggest climaxes of that story uh, are when you're performing and it really feels great. They nailed the feeling of performance, which is something really hard to do. Um, 
overall, I I loved this game. Um, I really love the narrative. I love the story. I love the characters, and I liked the the rhythm stuff. I all worked for me. That art style is gonna turn a lot of people off. Um, and these games in general are not for everybody. I mean, but if you do like these kind of games and you're not uh, repelled by the style and and you think it's interesting, absolutely give this a try. It's a no brainer for me if you have any interest in it. Like if you saw a trailer like I want to play that, absolute play, absolutely play it. It's one of my favorite experiences of the year. Okay. Um, what was I gonna ask? <laughs> No, you covered a lot of it. Yeah. Like every time I was gonna ask something, like, "Oh yeah, no, you just gonna cover it right now." Um, oh, so you mentioned like the different like choices. Um, mm-hmm. Is there a way to make sure that everyone survives? You get like a true ending, or is it like you have to um, make certain decisions along the way so that way it will eventually like close off several endings? I want to be clear no one dies <laughs> but you never see anybody die at least let me let me rephrase that no one dies on screen and there is not really it's not like that kind of mass effect 2 style ending where you literally lock out opportunities because people go away it's not that harsh like i said it's all natural which means yes you may not necessarily see it coming if there is a character interaction that you missed you may realize it later at the end oh this option is grayed out implying this is what happened to me an option at the end was grayed out implying that there was something i could have done that i didn't do with one of the characters but it's really light it's not needed just like it's not an important enough for you to like need to see all endings and it encourages a second playthrough if you want to check out see oh what did i miss and it's also really good because it's one of those moments where you can share with other people who have played the game. Oh, did you get this? Was this great out for you? And see what they say. And then maybe that does incentivize uh, you to try it again with that kind of perspective. So no, it's not something that I think that you'll be like, ah, oh, man, I really wish I had talked to this person because it sucks that I didn't get this. I didn't feel like that at all. Because for me, the experience was about the natural progression of the story organically. It wasn't, it didn't feel super video gamey in that way, at least to me. But if you're a completionist, maybe it'll, it'll feel different by the end. Okay. Um, now, also with like Life is Strange, um, and what was, uh, what was the desert one? Like Desert Road End or something? Oh, yeah. Oh, du- totally. Dusk. Till Dusk? T- until, until, du- no, no. Um, until, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Is that the name of that thing? Until dusk, I don't know. Anyway, it's not until dawn. That's a different until game. dawn is a different game. That's the horror game. Yes. Yeah. Whatever. So that anyway. was called until dusk. Anyways, uh, at the end of like a chapter, it tells you like what you chose compared to what everyone else chose. That's the one thing I wish this had. It does not. It does not ah. have that. So you do not know what the percentage of people who made those decisions were. But in a way, like I said, I think they were trying to purposely avoid feeling video gaming in that way. And it makes you focus more on the story and how you would react if you were playing as the character. And I think because that's the intent, they do not show you the percentages. And I, though I do wish that maybe in like a new game plus kind of way, they did surface that in a second playthrough. Uh, maybe that's a future patch they could do. I don't know, maybe. Um, or if they could like put that on a website somewhere. But the game itself in its first playthrough does not surface those stats. Okay. Um it's available for everything. Uh it's only like thirty dollars. Yeah, thirty dollars. So yeah, it's not, P- not a high of of entry either. No. PC and PS5 right now. Uh no word on whether it will go to other co- other platforms in the future. I could see this as a really sl- an easy slam dunk for iOS at some point when they're ready for it. Okay. Uh but yeah, so sounds like a good game. Yeah, I had a lot of uh, fun with it. I've also been uh, continuing my Starfield adventure. I think I'm cooling off a little bit on it. Um, it's got become a little samey kind of in the, in the back end. I want to push through and finish the campaign, though, if just to see what people are talking about with the mythical New Game Plus stuff that's at the end. I want to find out what that is, and then I'll put it down. But 
But for now, uh, I had a whole lot more fun, I think, with Good- Goodbye Volcano High than than Starfield. But I am really enjoying Starfield. I'm not one of those people who are, you know, ready to shit on it. Like, it seems like really f- <laughs> popular right now to shit on Starfield. But I still think it's a really good experience. I still recommend it. But Goodbye Volcano High is on another level for me and probably is my number one game right now. All right. Um I might check this out. You said you bought it on PC, I, though. I, I think you'd like it, uh, but it's on PS5. Yeah, uh, there's no um, physical version, is there? No, I don't no, believe so. It's just digital. Right. Yeah, I, I might check this out. I, 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 I think actually... you'd like it. I think if you like Life is Strange, you'll like you'll find mm-hmm. things to like here. All right. Um, I so I ended up playing a bit of the Sid Meier's. Oh, Civilization, Civilization that's right. You were going to go into a civ hole this week. I forgot. Yes. Uh, so I played the tutorial, and I really liked the tutorial, except I liked it a bit too much because at the end it kind of throws you into like an actual game scenario. <laughs> and I just like, oh, well, I'm in the tutorial, so the barbarians in the other cities are not going to officially attack me because it's just a tutorial. You can't really lose the tutorial. So right. I got completely sidetracked in just building all my cities and not doing an army because I figured, oh, they're not going to attack me. So I just got so involved in that that by the time I reached like turn 200, I was like, wait, this is turn 200. Should I be done by now in a tutorial version? <laughs> to the point where I was like, wait, let me open. There's an actual objective list here. I forgot that this existed. Oh, I am supposed to go and defeat like the barbarian army. It's like, oh. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so yeah, I got too sidetracked. Uh, that was my problem. One of my worries going into a game like this is that there's gonna be so many options in real time strategy for me to do that I will completely forget to do the actual objectives and just do like, oh, I want to make sure my city's all leveled up and all leveled up and all leveled up before I convert them all into the next thing. And I just want to keep leveling them up and leveling them up because it's just not soft. And that's yeah, you, where I ended. <laughs> yeah, you can't think of it as that kind of thing or else you're going to be in a constant loop. Yes, I'm going to hit the end <laughs> of the turns and then like the cap and be like, oh, well, I failed because I didn't progress anywhere beyond my own city. <laughs> yeah, people are just going to start ransacking you out of nowhere soon. Just wait. Yes. Yeah. Well, see, I don't think so because it's a uh, <laughs> tutorial. So I got out of the <laughs> tutorial and started to do um, the actual campaign of Alexander the Great. But then it was nothing like the tutorial because it threw me in. I was like, hey, you have these three cities. Go at it. I was like, I yeah. thought I was starting from zero. What are you doing to me now? They're tossing you to the swimming pool and t- telling you to swim. Just You got to just go for it. You got to figure it out. I know. Well, that's where I'm at. That's where I kind of like <laughs> left off all right well good luck (laughs) all right anyway if that's it for video games we've been playing which Mm -hmm. i believe it might be we can move on to television and we always start television with the sports corner i mean we kind of had a sports corner with uh yes taylor swift but we did and usher but there were other news in the sports world this week starting with the nfl the Dolphins put up 70 points in one game uh, this week. Uh, yes. The, the record is 72 points. Um, there hasn't been a 70-point game since 1966. Woo! Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was quite a blowout there. Meanwhile, yes. the Falcons and the uh, Jaguars played in London. and They uh, will play in they London. They will play in week. London. Oh, and oh, sorry, this, this hasn't happened yet. Okay, so yes, just a will, reminder: the right. upcoming week, they will play will in London, like... and on Disney platforms, including Disney Plus and Hulu, you can see Toy Story characters uh, call the game or just be there while the game is on. Or uh, from what the advertising, they will be playing the game as the players. What in a Toy Story esque game? Huh? It's going to be set in Andy's room, and they're going to be animated versions of the players as they play the game. I have no idea what this is. I have no <laughs> idea what's going on, but 
it's so interesting, bizarre that I have to mention it, and yeah. we'll check this out. So weird. I don't understand um, it. But yes, because it is Falcons versus Jaguars in London, that does mean that we get a 6.30 a.m. game on the West Coast, 3.30 a.m. Uh, uh, 9.30 a.m. Yeah, yeah, on the East Coast. But yeah, um, so a game before the regular like 10 o'clock, 1 o'clock games start. Too early, if you ask me. Not early. Not enough. We need more football. 24 <laughs> hours of football. God, no. Well, the good news is, is that there's a, been a lot of good football if you live in Miami, Philadelphia, and San Francisco, as those are the only NFL teams that remain undefeated. Uh, and yes, rightfully so. My uh, Philadelphia uh, was in the Super Bowl last year. San Francisco was in the NFC Championship game last year. And Miami has a healthy Tua Tagovailoa who is not yeah. injured yet. Yes. And they just put up 70 points. So domination. Doing pretty well, I would say. Uh, so, yeah, that is your uh, the, your undefeated teams. Meanwhile, Denver, Carolina, Minnesota, and Chicago remain without any wins at all. So uh, hopefully they'll the get surprise their surprise here soon. being Minnesota, as they were a playoff team last yeah. year. Um, they've also lost all three games by less than a score. So. Yeah. Rough. Still close, but not quite there yet. Uh, Carolina has the rookie quarterback. Chicago has the flailing Justin Fields, which we mm. all knew, but no one believed. I still don't believe in him. They still do <laughs> for some reason. Don't know. And then Denver, who was the team that the Dolphins put the 70 points up mm-hmm. against. Um, they have come out and said that no one will be fired for putting up 70 points. <laughs> that being said yeah. um no one in denver is happy right now i wouldn't be either um so that is your nfl uh, uh picture this week moving on to baseball as you probably know it is the end of september we are almost to october which means playoff baseball is on the horizon but in order to know what the playoff picture looks like the divisions have to finish up and find out who clinches, and the AL West still doesn't have a winner. Uh, as of today, the Texas Rangers are, what, two and a half games up? Yes, yeah. but, but the Houston Astros and the Seattle Mariners yes. could both still win the division. However, here's the key difference. The Rangers right now are in a series against the Angels. <laughs> and will likely... Get two more wins. <laughs> Let's be real here. Yo, so, we play them today and tomorrow. So yeah. So as the report on that one, it looks like the Rangers do have an advantage, uh, possibly. So uh, yeah, um, I would be happy if the Rangers take it over the Astros. I just don't want the Astros in there anymore. Like a- anymore, I don't want them to even have a chance. Whatever to get Seattle into the playoffs. Whether it's yeah. winning the division or the wild card, I'm <laughs> kind of all that. in on Seattle at this point. I, I was the same way last year, and it didn't quite work out. But this maybe it can happen again um, if they get there again, and maybe they'll do a little better than they did last time out. Mm-hmm. Uh, because yeah, the poor guys—they never been to the World Series. Send them to the World Series. Let's do it. They earned it. Win Good one for the city. Guys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, the wild card playoffs will begin next week. 11 teams are competing for those six remaining spots. So we'll see. So those would be one division winner Mm -hmm. and then five of the six um, wild card spots are open. They have not been clinched yet. That's key. Only one uh, playoffs. One wild card has been clinched and that's by Tampa Bay. That's because they're 10 games over the next (laughs) closest team. (laughs) Right. Yeah. So so, other than that, um, the remaining spots can just be jockeyed up and down, yeah. including the San Diego Padres, who are still yes. stand at a 1% chance of getting there. But hey, <laughs> not technically eliminated yet. <laughs> you're, they're the, you're saying I have a chance of baseball right now. It's the mathematically you're not eliminated yet. Right, mathematically. Uh, so yeah, we'll see what happens um, in the coming weeks with that. I'm looking forward to seeing who's in that picture. Mm-hmm. Then lastly, sports news. We have a NASCAR update. Last year's winner, Joey Logano, has been eliminated. Round of 12 continues this weekend at Talladega. Yes, Logano 
uh, will not be able to repeat back to back champions. And Talladega uh, Knights are coming this weekend <laughs> to yes. a racetrack and city near you. If you're not or first, you're last. Near you. If you're not first, you're last. That's what I mean. Not first, you're eliminated. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> All right. Anything else in sports before we move on? Uh, in WWE Sports Entertainment, because of the writer strike, um, this is for all of you people who say that one, it's scripted, and two, they're <laughs> actors. One, it's not scripted because they're still going because the WGA strike is still going on. And two, they're not actors because the SAG strike is going on. And because both the writers and the SAG strike and the actor strike are going on, that means for the first time in years, both The Rock and John Cena appeared on the same night because they had nowhere else to go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. But hey, um, thank you, I guess, for that. Fun seeing them <laughs> back and also being up on Austin Theory. Anytime that happens, I am well for it. Uh, but uh, I believe it was two weeks ago, the official merger for Endeavor WWE UFC went through. Mm-hmm. And cuts have been made. Your yeah. favorite uh, wrestler may not be there anymore. Looking at you, <laughs> original bro. I don't know who that is. Matt Riddle. He's gone. Uh, yeah. So, uh, check your local rosters. They may or may not be there. <laughs> also, um, yeah. Uh, that that went through. That's official now. Endeavor owns UFC and WWE all under the same banner. Oh, I should mention, I spe- uh, speaking of, um, this was technically in the, yeah, we're in the television section. This is relevant. Yeah. Um, so ten, t- tonight in England, the British Bake Off is back. Uh, tomorrow, I believe it will air on Netflix here. You're probably wondering, why the hell am I mentioning this? The reason is, is because Christy and I developed a fantasy draft for the British Bake Off this season. Really? And I wanted to see if it passed muster to you uh, how okay. we did it. So there are 12 contestants. So what we did, our draft was we've drafted half and half. So six and six. So we okay. flipped the coin and then we just picked six names. So Christy. Sight de- unseen, just names. So all we have is their name, their age, and a brief background of their profession. So like what okay. they do. So for example, it's like Abby, age 27, veg, 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 uh, veggie uh, delivery driver. And that's all we have to go off. Of. Okay. Um, and so Christy developed a, um, a point uh, method for us. Um, here, let me pull it up here. Uh, so one point each week for each contestant still in competition. So if they're not eliminated by the end of the episode, you get one point mm-hmm. for each of your six. Three points each week if any contestant is named Star Baker, which if you're not familiar with the show, that's like the winner yeah. of that week's challenge. Ten points for each contestant who makes it into the top three of the finale. Okay. And then an automatic win if your winner is your favorite of your six competitors. So we have a, a one, we, we're each able to choose one of our six that is our favorite. Uh, uh, the and, one that yeah. you think is going to win out of your own six. Right. So regardless of points at the end, if your favorite wins, you automatically win. Okay. But of course, any of your six could be eliminated. So that loses opportunities to get points every week. Mm-hmm. And so it'll be really interesting to see what happens. So I've seen something similar like this with like American Idol, The Voice yeah. and Project Runway. I had an old uh, manager who used to do fantasy drafts for The Bachelor. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she used to like do it up on a like a, a a whiteboard at work and show us her logic between everything and I'm like oh that sounds fun <laughs> um so yeah we thought it would be fun to do it this time so i will report back next week to see to tell you uh how that's going <laughs> i will say your odds are better going 1v1 than putting four people in there oh, or yeah. even three people and you each pick three people yeah it's four really people. we all four people we and initi- three people because, yeah, yeah, we initially said we're, we're only going to choose three. And I was like, that's going to be really tricky because what if we're really wrong and all th- all six of our options are gone by week right, six? Halfway and then through, we're like, yeah. well, crap, now we're just out. We're both out. So this keeps us in the game the whole season, which is which is fun. You know, un- unless one person just automatically loses the first six and the first <laughs> six out of eight. <laughs> for six weeks. Yeah, they're all. <laughs> yeah. it. it could happen, but it's very unlikely is what I'll say. So anyway, all right, 
we can we can get back on the rails. I just wanted to mention that while we were talking <laughs> about fantasy. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Third, third week three in fantasy. Um, fantasy football. Like I said, in London. So set your lineups early <laughs> for that. Yes. All right. Well, in that case, let's move off of television uh, sports news. We're going to stay in television news and talk about actual television news stories. And our first story takes us to Amazon Prime. And guess what? They're no, uh, they're not alone in cranking up prices, just like we've had stories in the last few weeks about other streaming services cranking up prices. This time it's Amazon's turn, although they're doing it in kind of a sneaky way. In a bid for more money and following the likes of the other uh, uh, streaming services, an ad-supported tier will be now offered for Amazon Prime's customers. The company says it plans to run fewer ads on Amazon Prime Video than traditional broadcasters or broadband rivals, which to be specific is four minutes per hour seems to be the benchmark for the lowest amount of ad time on a streaming platform. Commercials will first appear in the US, UK, Germany, and Canada in early 2024, followed by France, Italy, Spain, Mexico, and Australia later in the year. Those who want to keep Amazon Prime Video ad-free can still do so for an additional $2.99 per month. That's a total of $36 a year because most people buy Prime annually in the U.S. on top of the annual prescription for Prime as it is. Amazon said the decision to run ads during Prime Video selections would help it, quote, continue investing in compelling content and keep increasing that investment over a long period of time, which is the answer you get whenever you ask these content uh, companies for why they're increasing prices. In addition to paying millions for the rights to the NFL's Thursday Night Football, Amazon acquired MGM Studios back in May of 2021 for $8.5 billion. Over the years, it has launched premium series, including The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan, and The Wheel of Time, to varying uh, critical and audience results. Uh, so, to be clear, unlike how Netflix and the others did it, you have to opt out of getting the ads, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. In the other ones, Amazon, uh, uh, Netflix was like, yeah, we have an ad tier. It's cheaper if you want it. Right. This Otherwise, you just automatically be bumped up to the yeah. ad free tier. No, this, this is, is different. Yeah. yeah. This is the opposite of that. This is everybody's going to be served ads. And it's up to you to pony up the additional money to stop the ads from happening. It almost feels like a micro microtransaction of $3 yeah. a month. Like, hey, right. here's an ad. Do you want to unsubscribe from ad? Yes. Here's $3. Yes, please. It is, I didn't think about that. But yes, you're 100 right it's the mobile game uh thing it is hey we do pay this money and you never see an ad again it's literally that um, until the month is up and then you'll see another ad and be like hey your time's up would you like to re mm -hmm. re up your uh zero ad battle pass <laughs> yeah this is a pain honestly i'm glad i don't watch a whole lot of amazon prime um because this is seems like a reason not to care uh mm-hmm it's just, it's absurd. Like, at least give you the op, like, I'll maybe introduce it as a lower tier, but making everybody do it until they tell you no, there should be some sort of, like, law against that, in my opinion. That's, like, the equivalent of checking out, and I have a box pre-checked that you, that you have to notice in order to, like, not be... Opt out of subscription services. Like, yeah. signed up for their, like, newsletter yes. or something. It's, yep. it's, like, we solved this in other way, in other um, services, like, like, carts on a website like how is this still happening how is amazon still able to do this shit of course important note we don't we're not an internet podcast so we don't cover this stuff but this coincides with the ftc finally doing their huge sweeping amazon suit uh that is going to find out maybe for like for good whether or not amazon really is a monopoly um the ftc is going starting that discovery process right now so it's interesting that they're doing something this stupid, in my opinion, at the same time that that's happening. It's also coinciding with the other streaming services of Disney, Netflix, and Warner Brothers Discovery Max to um, initiate a lobbying for mm -hmm. streaming um, going forward. Yeah. Uh, I saw that news earlier today that they are now... 
at what, what point seem like fighting with each other, now trying to coalesce all all their lobbying funds together to lobby Congress to make yeah. sure streaming stays the way they want it. Um, in other streaming news, we haven't talked about this on the podcast yet, but I wanted to sneak it in here. Uh, Max finally announced their plans for live sports. I don't know if you saw this. I did so, not. So starting next month, Max is going to roll in live sports from their uh, family of channels, including broadcast sports from TBS and TNT. This does not... Just in time for baseball. Yes, just in time for baseball playoffs. This does not include AEW. So wrestling fans mm-hmm. who are getting excited for that potentially, no, that wasn't part of the deal. This does, though, include, yes, crucially, baseball playoffs and also crucially, March Madness basketball next year. Mm-hmm. Here's what they're doing about the pricing. Until March of 2024, this will be included in your existing Max subscription. You will not have to pay any premium for it. Starting in March 2024, you will. So if you are getting excited for March Madness basketball, keep this in mind. You will eventually have to pay a premium price to keep live sports on your Max subscription. So yes, this will be next month in October when it happens and rolls out. We'll talk about it then. But yeah, I just want to mention on the podcast since we hadn't mentioned it. It was one of my motivating factors for calling Spectrum and delete and <laughs> canceling my TV service this week. Because <laughs> yeah, I'll get the TPS playoff games on Max. I won't need cable. Yes. I wonder, will you get any of the CBS uh, March Madness games? I have, an, uh, I have an antenna that I plugged into my television. I have over-the-air CBS and it comes in crystal clear, baby. Well, no, I asked because <laughs> if you get the sports package, but then you're left out of one channel and right. your game will want have to be on that channel. Yeah. Do you then have to be forced to sign up for <clears throat> Paramount Plus? Yeah. That's kind of what they want you to do. And the, that's what all these things are about. It's like, we're going to give you a taste until the thing that you want is so specific, you have to get cable. It's the regional mm-hmm. sports move. It's the like, we're going to force you to pay for us no matter what. Um yeah. Uh, last last uh, last note about that that discovery thing. I don't get uh, ABC or Fox on that antenna. I just get CBS and NBC, <laughs> like rats. So, Wait, you okay. can't watch The Golden Bachelor? I know. God forbid. Good thing that's on Hulu. <laughs> Anyways, enough of that, of that. Let's move on to our second story. Speaking of Fox, or at least somebody who used to be affiliated with Fox. Um. Rupert Murdoch is in the news this week, but this time, well, yeah, he's in it because he's not longer going to be in yeah, it because he's stepping down from television. Media mogul Rupert Murdoch, who unfortunately shares a birthday with me, um, <laughs> fun fact, uh, not like age wise, but like day. Hold on, the thing is doing the thing. All right, there we go. Um, is stepping down as the chairman of what remains of Fox Corp and News Corp effective as of the annual meetings for his companies in November. Lachlan Murdoch, no relation, no, actually, yes, relation, will continue to lead the two companies. Lachlan has already taken over much of the family business, serving as CEO of Fox Corp and as co-chairman of News Corp. In a letter to employees, Rupert noted that both he and his companies are in, quote, robust health, unquote. Yeah, I believe when I see it, Rupert. However, he also said that he believes the, quote, battle for freedom of speech and ultimately the freedom of thought, I roll, has never been more intense, end quote. Fox Corporation has been dealing with a number of controversies over the past year, including the ouster of Tucker Carlson back in April and the defamation suit and subsequent $787 million settlement for said defamation suit with Dominion Voting Systems after broadcasting falsehoods about the 2020 presidential election. So if there was a time to get out, this would be the time. And he got out. I mean, not just because of his health, but also, yes, because of this, these yeah. lawsuits that we've been talking about for the past yeah. three years now. It's um, corporate tradition that somebody takes the fall for something big like this. And usually it's the guy up top. And what more top, it, top can you get than Rupert Murdoch? So, yeah. So it's funny that this is happening now, just as succession ended a couple of months <laughs> back. <laughs> right. It's like, yeah, hey, it's a... I just saw this. Yeah, it's now real it's version. art imitating life, imitating art. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. the guy sucks. Um, I'm glad that he won't have day to day operations. But if his statement is in, in any indication, he's leaving it in control of people who have the same bad intentions to run his companies as he did. 
Yeah, so Rupert Murdoch has uh, two sons, one of them left-leaning, one of them right-leaning. Guess <laughs> which who one? Who got the Lachlan is. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Makes you think. Um, so yeah, no surprises here. This was going to happen eventually, and it doesn't really change much, except for now that Rupert Murdoch can go be somewhere where we don't have to see his face all the time. Watch uh, Lachlan try and like one up his father by trying to purchase Newsmax and then ultimately okay. failing at it. <laughs> Honestly, I'd like to see them fall on their face. That would be great. All or right, when news or OAN and just okay. be like, what do we have here? There's nothing here. Oh, God. Don't even. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, you watch some television. Um, yes. Let's talk about it. I watch some stuff on Netflix. Well, I watched, so I watched Ahsoka. I'm all caught up on it. I thought it was only six episodes. Turns out it's eight. So mm-hmm. I'll be wrapping that up in two weeks. Okay. Um, I believe that Only Murders in the Building wraps up next week as well. Uh, if not tonight, I'm not sure. Um, uh, no, but maybe uh, last week. week there were right, two episodes. Week. It's next week. Next week. So we'll talk about that maybe next week maybe the week after yep um and then futurama has the half season completed on hulu uh 10 episodes are up it's completed out of the 20 that have been ordered unsure if that's gonna be split into two seasons or if they're gonna tack it on to the end of this one in a spring kind of release but we will see on that yep. uh but in the meantime that's just what i've been watching uh a staple of Netflix mm-hmm. has reared his head yet again <laughs> as Love is Blind season five is here. Oh boy. And they needed to do something to change it up. And they did one of, I don't know if it's either idiotic or genius yet. We'll see. <laughs> in the boy side and in the girl side, they are, there is. A couple who used to date, they are now exes, but they're both in this same experiment of love is blind. Presumably, having broken up three months ago, are now going to be engaged to someone completely new okay. three months after breaking up. And this person has to see them like, hey, like we were in a relationship and now we broke up and now you're going to get married to someone Three months after we last banged. <laughs> Good luck with that. I mean, yeah. There, there's your plot synopsis of what season five is. Jeez. Is it good? Is it bad? I don't know, but it's juicy and it's interesting, especially as they try and sabotage each other. <laughs> uh, it's oh, yeah, man. that's the hook this season. <laughs> uh, aside from it being the traditional love is blind and Nicholas Shea being there. Yeah. And Vanessa trying to farm a baby out of this. <laughs> God. Oh, yeah. My uh, God. Season five is back. That does mean that um, the previous season, season four, um, the reunion episodes, those are up as well for you to watch if you want to see how they're doing now and how basically everything was resolved and there was no lingering questions. And I was kind of disappointed that there was nothing like lingering from like, previous seasons but yeah season five it's up um weekly up weekly drops every friday um mm. going through the end of october okay they're just um adding to the fuel on the fire that will be the inevitable second season of perfect match right exactly yes because <laughs> <laughs> they'll just both be on there and be like yes we know we, we failed there but hey we're gonna try it here <laughs> yeah anyways anyways also on Netflix, the finale, 25 years in the making. And I know what you're thinking. Wait, hasn't Netflix only been streaming since <laughs> uh, since 2007? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. 25 years in the making. The finale has finally hit U.S. shores. Pokemon, mm-hmm. to be a Pokemon master, the dubbed version yeah. is now available on Netflix. I have a question for you. So did you watch all of these episodes? I watched all 12 episodes. I'm judging by the tone of your voice. You know why I'm asking this. 
I am three episodes in. And I'm like, I don't know if I have the willpower to get through this. It is so I I was looking forward to these episodes because they're supposedly going to play on the nostalgia of the series. They're going to bring back characters and locations and Pokemon that he's caught over the 25 years of the series, trying to make you feel nostalgic and warm and fuzzy for all these old things coming back and mixing in different ways. Like, it's cool to see characters who were in the original three season interacting with people from the black and white seasons. And it's a fun concept in theory, but in practice, it suffers the same problem as a lot of the series does, which is, oh my God, the formula is so formulaic and boring now. Does it get better? Are there certain episodes that aren't as formulaic? Is the last, should I just skip to the last episode? Because I feel like I'm watching filler. So, the reason I say all 12 episodes <laughs> is because in Japan, as we reported here, there are only 11 episodes Yeah, as part of the original run in, in Japan. Okay. That 12th episode is one of those uh, like TV specials that they're just tacking on here to be considered <laughs> the 12th Got it. episode okay. instead of the 11. So if you want the true ending, it's 11 <laughs> episodes. Got it. But if you want the complete ending, it's 12 episodes. Um, To answer your question, though, (laughs) when this was airing earlier this year in February Uh, and March, I was watching the YouTube recaps of it. So I knew what was going to happen. This isn't like mind blowing to me of like what they're doing. (laughs) That being said, yes, you're right. It is very formulaic. (laughs) It is exactly what you think. It's not what you want it to be. And that was a lot of yeah. the complaints that people had when it was originally airing in Japan is that people here in the U.S. aren't getting that huge nostalgia factor, that boost, that, oh, I want to see Brock and Misty interact with the Alola region. <laughs> right. I want to see uh, a Halucha interact with a Heracross. Like, you don't get that kind of, like, interaction. You do get the feels of nostalgia with that 11th episode but also with that finale episode the 11th episode it is more of a never-ending journey of yes ash never went was never set out to to be the pokemon champion he set out to be a pokemon master so what does that mean to be a master and ultimately that is that the journey never ends you'll never be you'll never be satisfied you'll never find the ending there is no Mm -hmm. end to his journey and that's why they kind of leave it open-ended of to be continued because his journey never ends he will forever be 10 years old and of course the unspoken thing here is that i might be a little spoiled coming off of horizons Mm -hmm. Uh, i am so i was watching uh fan subs of horizons as they were airing uh, I've dropped off of doing that because they became too hard to find. <laughs> I think some <laughs> somebody got in trouble is what I'll say. And Probably. so I'm now just waiting until the dub uh, to finish up. And it's actually wrapping up the first part in Japan right now. Um, it's going to be divided in parts, I guess, because, hey, there's an actual story this time. And that's <laughs> what I'm coming where I, what I mean when I'm saying that I'm a bit spoiled by it. I think it the new like i say if this has the same effect to you as it does to me like listeners out there wait for horizons because it's doing some interesting things with actually having a story that matters characters that develop and you're not feeling like all right we're at this time in the story uh team rocket's going to show up and now and then they show up and then you know it's just like it just got to the point where i'm like you guys have done this too many times like and i just burned out on it i guess but yeah wait for her yeah, well even when it was announced the the these final episodes like people like people and fans maybe because we were just like delved deep into the rumor mill of like well they announced this this is definitely going to be like an ode to yeah. pokemon an ode yeah. to the the seasons of the past an ode to every one of his yeah. pokemon is going to get their own like special spotlight and do something yeah I think ultimately, no. I yeah, I thought it was going to be something more than it was, and I came out a little disappointed by it. But yeah, 
what that's yeah. that's what I get for assuming that was going to be more than it was. <laughs> anyway, well, that's the benefit I get from watching the recaps six months ago when they it's were frustrating because it wasn't like there weren't moments in the original run where there were creativity. Um, the X and Y series had a lot of really cool set like moments that felt different and not as formulaic. Sun and Moon did some really creative original episodes where, mm -hmm. oh, in this, th this couple episodes, all the, all our uh, characters are superheroes. Oh, in this couple ep episodes, they're making a movie. Oh, like they did interesting things with the premise. And I was hoping that that's what they would do here. And no, they just want to give you the easy comfort food of Ash battles a person. Ash, uh, get uh, team rocket shows up. They beat team rocket. If Ash you battles the person watch again, and wins. that nostalgia kick. There's one episode. It's with the Squirtle Squad. Oh, fun! Okay, that's the one. That right. one, and probably the the eleventh episode. Yeah, are the I'm two that gonna... give you the 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 watch most nostalgic yeah. kick out of everything. Just I'll watch, watch those, those two. Yeah, I'll Just watch, watch those, those two. <laughs> All right, because cool. that because that to the one with the Squirtle Squad, he brings back. Bulbasaur and Charizard is like, hey, like we're all friends again. Remember our journeys. Yeah, that's and then the last yeah. ones. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was hoping for. So, right, yeah, we'll that, 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 that's probably more what you're looking for. But that's also the only episode that and then you feel any of that in. I believe the first Netflix drop of uh, Horizons is next month, so yes. we won't have to wait long. So, yep, it's exciting. I just hope that they don't use that leaked uh theme song they leaked uh, leaked an english language theme song for it last month mm -hmm. and it sucks <laughs> so i'm hoping it's not the real one uh but hey it probably is hey, maybe they leaked it so they could test it the japanese one is pretty good anyways let's move on to some cancellations and renewals Why don't what am i no longer watching you are no longer watching blind spotting on stars but no one was because it's on stars it was canceled after two seasons as was Run the World. Well, not, not on Stars because that's also canceled after two seasons. And Heels canceled after two seasons on Stars. A Stars massacre, everybody. Also, then, Stars was probably the last one holding out on these. <laughs> probably. And then we have uh, one renewal. AMC has renewed Dark Winds for a third season. I don't know. Whatever that was. Sure, whatever that was. We have a couple of deaths uh, real briefly here. Catherine Anderson, age 79, was the singer for The Marvelettes. Then we have David McCallum, age 90, an actor, was in The Man from Uncle, NCIS, and The Great Escape. Uh, That's The Man from Uncle TV series. And that is uh, Ducky from NCIS, long standing uh, actor from that show. He's 90. Probably what most wow. people know, recognize him from. Yeah, but 90, that's, yeah, quite a, quite yeah. a life. Let's move on into movies, the final section of the show. And we start that section with the weekend box office numbers. Your number one movie is still The Nun 2. I believe it is third week at number one with yep. another $8.5 million. That's at a nice $69 million domestic. Number two, Expend expend Fourbles with another $8 million. Or uh, actually they, with $8 you million. They they million. $8 million. That is the fourth Expendables movie. Number three, A Haunting in Venice, with another $6.3 million. That's at 25. Number four, The Equalizer 3, with another $4.7 million. That's at 81 domestic. And rounding at your top five, still kicking, Barbie, with another $3.2 million. That's at $630 million, still your best performing movie of 2023. Upcoming this week in uh, theaters... You have something for the adults, something for the kids, something for the freaks, and something for question mark, question mark, question mark. You have Dumb Money, which is the movie about the GameStop stock run of 2022. Mm -hmm. I lived it. I don't need to see a movie about it. <laughs> uh, then you have for the kiddies, Paw Patrol, colon, the mighty movie, which is the Paw Patrol gets super, super, superpowers. Superpowers. Yep. Really pushing this. Uh, kids uh, will love it. Saw X or Saw 10, depending on who you ask, a yet another Saw movie just in time for October. And lastly, The Creator. This is the um, John David Washington movie about robots. 
not technically AI. <laughs> uh, not is it Neil Blomkamp? Is it maybe? No, 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 because he did Gran Turismo. Yeah, he did Gran Turismo. No, this yeah. is the other guy. This is um. Oh, what's... <laughs> it's okay. We don't have time to yeah. look it up. It's fine. Uh, the creator. It's also in theaters this week. Okay, let's move on to some movie news, and we start in Japan where the storied Studio Ghibli, the iconic Japanese animation studio, has been sold to Nippon TV after failing to find a successor for its legendary co-founder and co-director, Hayao Miyazaki. The two companies' board of directors met on Thursday and approved a resolution for Nippon TV to acquire shares of Studio Ghibli, making it a subsidiary of the television, a subsidiary of the television network. The financial terms of the deal were not disclosed. Quote, with director Hayao Miyazaki now 82 years old and producer Toshio Suzuki also 75, Studio Ghibli has long been struggling with the issue of their successors, said the statement. Nippon TV will, quote, permanently protect Studio Ghibli's craftsmanship and brand values and intends to honor Studio Ghibli's autonomy so it can, quote, focus on filmmaking, end quote. It added that Miyazaki's eldest son, himself an animation film director, had been repeatedly suggested as a possible successor to his father, but he had declined that idea, claiming that it would be difficult for him to take over Ghibli on his own, and that it would be better to leave the future of Ghibli to someone else. End quote. Nippon TV and Studio Ghibli have long worked together, with the former broadcasting Ghibli films on air, investing in Ghibli movie productions, and even helping fund the recently opened Ghibli Museum. So, yeah, it makes sense. It's, I mean, it makes sense. It's kind of like a sad um, story where this iconic studio, mm -hmm. one, can't find a successor, or at least yeah. didn't want to appoint someone as a successor, and two, ultimately being sold to a larger company. Um, I mean, we see that a yeah. lot of here in the U.S. with mm -hmm. big companies looking to buy smaller companies, but here... It almost sounds like they at least like folded into it. Yeah, I think there's an allure and a desire for companies like this, especially creative artistic companies to remain independent. Mm -hmm. I think there's like, I don't know. I don't think this is actually true, but I think there's this illusion that, oh, there's more legitimacy in, of the art form if it is run by an independent studio and not owned by a corporate overlord. Whether or not that's actually true or not. Wow, I have a crazy ass lens flare lens happening flare, right now. yes um, it's really cool I just saw you that guys too. aren't watching the video version you're missing out on this it looks like the apocalypse in my room it's that right sunset now. yeah um but anyway um but at the same time though at least it's a company that they're familiar with at least it's one of the biggest tv studios in japan at least it's something that they know will financially be able to take care of them um but yeah it's pretty wild uh, i imagine that you're right i imagine there's a lot of people in Japan who see this as the bad, like it going badly, like it, like ending badly, a bad ending for the independent era of Studio Ghibli. Mm -hmm. But hey, if Miyazaki doesn't actually retire when he says he's going to retire, then you never have the successor. Like this is, that wasn't going to happen as long as he kept pushing the date back and back and back. He's still not retired. This last movie wasn't his last movie. He has ideas for another one. The man can't stop. And so, yeah, like, I like this was going to happen no matter what, as long as he was going to be the guy. Like, anyway. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense then for his son, who you, you would think would be the successor, but also wanted to go out and do his own thing, wanted to do his mm -hmm. own creativity. I mean, it was literally the plot of Inception, wanting yeah. to build something of your, of your own. <laughs> Right, right. It's just it's it's unfortunate how it ended up, up that way. But it seems like it's not the biggest deal. And it seems like it will at least be in hands that respect and vow to take care of the studio. So there's at least that. All right, let's get to our breaking news then, shall we? Yes, our breaking news and our biggest story in media this week by far is that the WGA, a deal has been made. In the latest negotiations between the WGA and studios uh, to end the nearly five-month-long writer strike, well, it looks like it happened, guys. 
During the meeting Saturday at the AMPTP Sherman Oaks office, the parties appeared to have essentially untangled their stalemate over AI, writing room staffing levels, and the last remaining matters of contention. Details of the WGA's tentative agreement haven't yet been released, or at least not in when this paragraph was written. Yes. Uh, but will be revealed by the Guild in advance of the membership ratification votes. Once the language of the WGA deal is done and the contract is ratified by membership, the next step for the AMPTP is to be making a deal with SAG-AFTRA, which will, of course, have its own set of challenges. A SAG-AFTRA spokesperson said on Tuesday, quote, when we do have dates confirmed, we will inform our members. No one should rely on, ex on speculation. Then, you have added this addendum today. Literally on. as of 5 o'clock uh, <laughs> of today. 5 o'clock so, today. While we were recording this podcast, I was like, yes. okay, oh, this news has to drop at some yeah. point. It's going to happen. And here it is. R eh, breaking news, yep. I guess. Here it is. <laughs> On the 148th day of the work stoppage, the board of the WGA West and the Council of the WGA East voted unanimously on Tuesday to lift the strike order as of 12.01 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesday, which is the 27th of September, following a tentative agreement on a new contract with the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers. Yes, that means writers can go back to work as of Wednesday, even before the ratification vote. That ratification vote will be held from October 2nd to October 9th. The WGA will Which hold is member basically meetings. Basically, just next week. Yeah. Next week. The WGA will hold member meetings on both coasts this week in person and on Zoom to discuss the details of the contract. Given the enthusiastic endorsement of the WGA negotiating committee, it is expected to be easily ratified by strike weary members. The WGA also released the complete 94-page contract and a summary of the new terms. The deal includes gains in compensation, a new requirement for minimum staff levels in TV writers' rooms, improvement payment terms or improved payment terms for screenwriters and protections for the use of artificial, artificial intelligence in the writing process. So every one of those check marks that they wanted to meet, the AMPTP actually did meet. Um, this is why if you look and compare the reaction to the deal that was struck after the 2008 strike and the one that was just strike for the uh, struck for the 2023 strike mm -hmm. they're completely night and day the 2008 one is like well this is the best we could do i guess we can go back to work now at least knowing it's slightly better than we were this time it was we are proud to announce that we got what we wanted essentially and it's great to see it's super heartening and like the first half of the story implies, this sets a template now for negotiations with SAG-AFTRA. Obviously, some of the things are going to be different, but a lot of this is the same things they were arguing. And it's going to give them more negotiation tactic in the negotiations that will likely happen next week. So when we talked about this last week, we had mentioned that the AMP, PTP sent WGA a 69 page <laughs> basically contract of what they should look for. All right. They ended up with a 94 page Four contract, yes. an extra 30 pages to say, yes. nah, this is what we are actually looking for. And to just go briefly go over some of those AI um, sticking points. Mm -hmm. One, AI can't write or rewrite liter literary mm -hmm. materials. Good. And AI-generated material will not be considered a source of material under the contract. Good. A writer can choose to use AI when performing writing services if the company consents mm -hmm. and provides the writer um, provides that the writer follows their policies, okay. um, meaning that they can't use specific AI software like ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. They have to use it within the, the studio created. They have to create their um, own language learning model as opposed to using one off the shelf. Yes. Also, the company um, must disclose to the writer if any materials given to them mm -hmm. have been generated by AI or, or incorporated any AI materials. Meaning that, hey, use this blurb, <laughs> but it's an AI-generated blurb, not right. someone created it. Um, and lastly, the WGA 
reserves the right to assert that exploitation of writer's material to train said AI <laughs> is prohibited by this contract or any other law. Okay. Okay. I mean, it sounds like it sounds like what they wanted more or less. Obviously, there could be some things that they did have to compromise on. Negotiations are about compromise, understandably. Mm -hmm. But the sheer excitement you sense from the guild means that it seems like for the most part, this was successful. Strikes work, folks. This is proof of it. This was the biggest, longest strike in media history. And it ended up succeeding. And that's a good lesson to learn, I think. 148 days work stoppage. Mm -hmm. um, as we said, this still needs to go to ratification, but the contracts are out there, nine, six pages for the writers to now come over. They mm -hmm. have a week to discuss it amongst themselves before the vote next week. Yep. And this is only for WGA. sag -AFTRA, currently 75 days on strike as well. Yep, so we'll see uh, if there's an update for you Next week about sag -AFTRA. we will see. But for now, at least the WGA has their deal. So that will do it uh, for movie news. And that'll do it for the Media Boat podcast this week, because I don't think we have any movies to talk about. Uh, Nope, I did not watch anything movie-related. Nope. Um, um, oh, the um, the Ronald, the Roll Doll, um, Henry Sugar. Comes mm. out for Netflix this upcoming week. Oh, uh, that's right. the Wes Anderson film. Okay. So possibly checking that out. <laughs> Maybe checking that. To continue the Wes Anderson yes. um, movie train that gone. Yes. I have a movie question for you for after the pod. Uh, I just okay. remembered. Uh, but for now, thank you for joining us for the Media Boat Podcast. It's been a good one. We'll have another good one next week. Uh, tune in. You can watch us via YouTube, where you can find our channel by searching Media Boat Podcast on there. Like, subscribe, click the bell for notifications when new videos are uploaded. You can also find us in audio form on podcast services such as Apple Play. Apple Play, I combine them. Apple Podcasts, <laughs> Google Play, Amazon, iHeartRadio, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts, search Media Boat Podcast. You can also find us on the web, mediaboatpodcast.com is where you'll find an archive of our shows as well as write-ups, including my thoughts about Goodbye Volcano High and Olivia Rodrigo's Guts. There's a, a couple of re recent picks. You can also find us on Twitter slash X, where we're Media Boat Cast. Facebook, search Media Boat Podcast to find us there. Twitch.tv slash Media Boat, where we occasionally play some video games. Um, and yeah, we'll be back next week for another episode with more news, more thoughts, more updates. So look forward to it. More of us. And yeah, uh, possibly more striking news. Um, Maybe. I mean, we'll, we'll at least get an update of like what everyone thinks of the <laughs> of this, because this yeah. is like just breaking here. It's just our initial thoughts on it, but we'll see what other people think of it and probably get a temperature gauge going into the vote next week. But yeah. We'll see. More news, more thoughts, more of us next week. All right. So see you guys next time. All right. Bye.